I've heard some pretty funny things in meetings about people's choice of higher power. I've heard people say, you could call it a doorknob. You could call it a rock. Let's imagine that you have a great big rock in your backyard. By the way, this is based on a true story that I heard from a guy. (laughs) He had this huge boulder in his backyard. He said, yep, that's my higher power. Okay. Let's put that to the test. Let's put that rock in the steps. Okay. Came to believe that a rock could restore me to sanity. Step two. Huh, that's interesting. Let's see, step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives out of the care of the rock as I understood it. <laughs> oh, well. Let's see, step five. Admitted to my rock. To myself and another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. <laughs> oh, well, I love this one, too. Step six. We're entirely ready to have my rock remove all these defects of character. <laughs> You gotta be careful where you use this example. You want to. You don't want to use this particular example in Cocaine Anonymous. Okay, all right. <laughs> but, the, but this is AA. Okay, we can do it here. Okay, not use it. Talk about it. Okay, all right. <laughs> but check this one out. Step seven. Humbly ask my rock to remove my shortcomings. Certainly. Okay. Let's, uh, let's jump down here. Oh, look what it says in. Uh, Step 11, stop through prayer and meditation to prove our conscious contact with my rock. As I understood it, praying only from the knowledge of my rock's will for me and the power to carry it out. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, boy. We're just so easily amused, aren't we? I need no one to entertain me up here. <laughs> me and my mind, we're just having a gay old time. The point is, make sure it's a power greater than you. I used women for a while, and that didn't work very well. 10 Meditations for Today 1. I will be happy. I will have no expectations nor will I make demands today. I will give up my need to know anything or understand anything. Instead, I shall pause and seek the will and guidance of God, which will come intuitively, if I just become still and quiet. 2. I will adjust myself to what is, and not try to adjust everything to my own desires. I will take my luck as it comes, and fit myself to the stream of life. 3. I will try to live through this day only and not tackle my whole life problem at once. I can do something for 12 hours that would appall me if I felt that I had to keep it up for a lifetime. Four. I will be agreeable. I will look as well as I can, dress becomingly, talk low, act courteously, criticize, not one bit, not find fault with anything and not try to improve or regulate anybody except myself. 5. It is none of my business what anyone thinks about me or about anything else and I don't have the power to make anyone change. That's God's job. 6. I will remember that it is not the experience of today that drives men mad it is remorse or bitterness for something which happened yesterday and the dread of what tomorrow may bring. I will remember that the past is gone, it's just an image in my mind. I also have no stake in the future for it is as yet unborn. Therefore, the present moment is the only real moment and it is only in the present moment that a conscious contact with God can be found. 7. I will cease fighting anything or anyone even alcohol because what I resist persists. 8. I will be unafraid. Especially I will not be afraid to enjoy what is beautiful. I will remember that I am a spiritual mirror and I will choose to believe that as I give love to the world, so the world will reflect love back to me. 9. I will have a quiet half hour all by myself and relax. During this half hour, I will try to get a better perspective of my life. My goal is a seen peace of mind through spiritual living. 10. I will exercise my soul in three ways. I will do someone a good turn and not get found out. If anybody knows of it, it will not count. I will do at least two things I don't want to do just for exercise. 
suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask Him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with Him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to Him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you. Until then. Here I was on a Saturday afternoon, alone in the Mayflower Hotel at Akron, Ohio. I walked down to the lobby, strode back and forth. At one end there was a plaque with the names of the various churches and preachers. At the other end of my beat there was a bar room. The bar room was filling up and so were the people in it. And that buzz, so characteristic to bars, uh, had a pleasant sound to me. Soon I found myself saying, well, perhaps I could go in there and have a drink of ginger ale and possibly scrape an acquaintance to pass away this lonely afternoon. And then I caught myself and thought, well, I have been restored to sanity. I can see I'm in danger. I walked over to the church directory again, thinking, well, now perhaps I had better find an alcoholic that I might talk to. Because at last, I see that I need such a person as much as he could possibly need me. I sometimes forget to feel gratitude for my sobriety. This is why I must continue to work with others, to go to meetings, to be of some service to the world around me. Not because these are good things, but rather so that I can once again be stimulated into feelings of gratitude for this life I have found.
Step 1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. Alcoholics Anonymous, The Doctor's Opinion, Roman Numeral, XXV and XXVI. Of course an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. The action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. That the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Chapter 3, More About Alcoholism, page 30. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people, or presently may be, has to be smashed. End quote. Your first step question. Do you fully concede to your innermost self that you are alcoholic? We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker.
At about 11 o'clock in the morning of the third day, my friend Abby stood in the door. As before, bright and cheerful. I remember being a little suspicious of him. I thought perhaps this time he'd turn on the evangelical heat. But no, he was a prudent man. We chatted about everything excepting drinking. And it finally put me in the position of having to ask him again about those simple principles for recovery. This admitting you were hopeless, well, that wasn't too hard. This getting honest with yourself and another person, well, one could do that. This making restitution for harms done other people, a tough job, but certainly one would try that. Working with others without any demand for money or acclaim. Well, that would be just wonderful. But when he came to the God part, again, I remember a terrible balking and rebellion. My friend promised when these things were done... I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. Simple, but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness, I must turn in all things to the Father of Light, who presides. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. That is how we react, so long as we keep in...
Now back here on page 25. Third paragraph. Page 25, paragraph 3. If you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there was no middle-of-the-road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there was no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, and the other to accept spiritual help. So here the authors are telling me that there's only two alternatives. Either keep drinking, keep living the way I am, or seek spiritual help. There's no middle-of-the-road solution. There's a way that you can explore that within yourself. By asking yourself this question. What would happen to Alcoholics Anonymous if every single member was doing sobriety the way I'm doing it today? What would happen if everybody was doing it the way I'm doing it? Is it middle of the road solution? Is that what you're seeking? Because if that's what you're seeking, that's what you'll receive. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. But So here on page 62 in paragraph 1 and 2, what we have is the problem. The problem is my selfishness, my self-centeredness. My troubles are of my own making. We all have issues, don't we, in sobriety. I have lots of issues, too. And you know what mine are? They're on this page. (laughs) These are my issues. Selfishness and self-centeredness. So, a couple of questions to consider. Are you willing to consider that selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of your troubles? Are you willing to consider that your troubles are basically of your own making? Now, that being the case, I'm going to show you a shortcut. The next time you're calling your sponsor and you want to whine about something, just cut the chase and call them up and say, Hey, I want to whine about me, okay? <laughs> Instead of complaining about everybody else, but I mean, check it out. I just conceded that selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my troubles. And that my troubles are basically of my own making. That being the case, and I bring a trouble to you, who am I complaining about? I'm complaining about me. Is that wild or what? That is wild. And the authors are telling me that I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. Now, if I'm driven by self-delusion, how am I going to know if I'm self-deluded? 
No, it's not a trick question. I'm not going to know. That's like going to a fish and asking it, what is water? It will say, well, you know, it's everywhere. That's how self-delusion is in my life. It's everywhere. In other words, I'm not going to know when I'm self-deluded. Why? Because I lack power. That's the reason I repeatedly go through the steps and maintain the disciplines of self-examination and rely on people around me to hold me accountable. Because I'm not capable of knowing when I'm self-deluded if I'm driven by self-delusion. See what a trap it is? Yeah, I know what I need to do. I know what's, I know what's best for me, certainly. I don't know what's best for me. I still don't know what's best for me today after 20 years of sobriety. If I knew what was best for me, I wouldn't be maintaining these disciplines. Anonymous original program as was reported by Frank Hamus in the book, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, pages 130-131. 1. An alcoholic must realize that he is an alcoholic, incurable from a medical viewpoint, and that he must never drink anything with alcohol in it. 2. He must surrender himself absolutely to God, realizing that in himself there is no hope. 3. Not only must he want to stop drinking permanently, he must remove from his life other sins such as hatred, adultery, and others which frequently accompany alcoholism. Unless he will do this absolutely, Smith and his associates refuse to work with him. 4. He must have devotions every morning a quiet time of prayer and some reading from the Bible and other religious literature. Unless this is faithfully followed, there is grave danger of backsliding. 5. He must be willing to help other alcoholics get straightened out. This throws up a protective barrier and strengthens his own willpower and convictions. 6. It is important, but not vital, that he meet frequently with other reformed alcoholics and form both a social and religious comradeship. 7. Important, but not vital, that he attend some religious service at least once weekly.
The start of Alcoholics Anonymous, a brief history. A seemingly unplanned meeting in Akron, Ohio in 1935 between two men, Dr. Bob Smith and Bill Wilson, both of whom were termed hopeless alcoholics, began a program of recovery that has helped millions find sobriety and serenity. Bill Wilson was fighting his own battle against drinking. He had already learned from the Oxford group that helping other alcoholics was the key to maintaining his own sobriety, the principle that would later become step 12 in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. The effect the meeting had on Dr. Bob was immediate, as he tells it in his own words and soon he too put down the bottle, June 10, 1935. One alcoholic talking to another alcoholic, the bond formed between these two men would grow into a movement that would literally save the lives of millions. Starting in an upstairs room at Dr. Bob's home in Akron, the two men began helping alcoholics one person at a time. Here's a quote from Dr. Bob's story in the big book. The Doctor's Nightmare. Page 180 paragraph 2. The question which might naturally come into your mind would be, what did the man do or say that was different from what others had done or said? It must be remembered that I'd read a great deal and talked to everyone who knew, or thought they knew, anything about the subject of alcoholism. But this was a man who had experienced many years of frightful drinking, who had had most all the drunkard's experiences known to man, but who had been cured by the very means I had been trying to employ, that is to say, the spiritual approach. He gave me information about the subject of alcoholism, which was undoubtedly helpful. Of far more importance was the fact that he was the first living human with whom I had ever talked who knew what he was talking about in regard to alcoholism from actual experience. In other words, he talked my language. He knew all the answers, and certainly not because he had picked them up in his reading. It is a most wonderful blessing to be relieved of the terrible curse with which I was afflicted. My health is good, and I have regained my self-respect and the respect of my colleagues. My home life is ideal, and my business is as good as can be expected in these uncertain times. I spend a great deal of time passing on what I learn to others who want and need it badly. I do it for four reasons. One, sense of duty. Two, it is a pleasure. Three, because in so doing I am paying my debt to the man who took time to pass it on to me. Four, because every time I do it, I take out a little more insurance for myself against a possible slip. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Was not a basic solution of these bedevilments more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight? Of course it was. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. 
We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them.